when robotic technology was developed, there were several companies that came out with these robots specifically for this type of procedure. There are areas of the brain you just don't want to touch. You don't want to get into the cracks and crevices of the brain because that may move your electrode as you're placing it into the brain. So the first thing that's done in order to do that is that we need a very detailed three-dimensional MRI. And that's what we use on a computer to plan where we're going to put our electrodes. So obviously at the end of our conference, we develop a hypothesis to say, okay, we're worried about left temporal lobe, right temporal lobe. We're not worried about anything else. So that is where we're going to put electrodes. Where are we going to put our electrodes? And we decide as a team where we want that information to come from. So we decide where to put them on a computer on the MRI. We merge that to a CAT scan that looks at all the blood vessels so that I can then switch the image from the MRI to the CAT scan and say, okay, is this electrode going to touch a blood vessel? And because the robot is so accurate, I can actually move it al like almost just four millimeters, avoid everything. And there are times when you have a ring of blood vessels and you're putting it right down the center. You cannot see anything. You're relying on the technology. So once that planning is done, the patient comes to the operating room, they undergo a general anesthetic, so they're asleep. They're fixed to the robot. So the robot is, it has a very large, heavy base with a robotic arm, just like you see on the, saw on the space shuttle many years ago that you see in car assembly lines. The ro so the patient has, is affixed to the robot by pins that are placed in the skull that are physically attached to the robot. So the head is not moving with respect to the robot. And then we, on the end of the robotic arm, we place a laser and tell the robot where certain points of the face and the forehead are. And that allows the robot to determine where the patient is in three-dimensional space with regards to the end of the robotic arm. And then the programming that we had done previously with all of our plans gets input into the robot. We change the arm from a laser to just a tubular tool holder, and then off we go. We tell the robot, go to position one. And if we want the electrode to come at this angle, in this direction, at this site, it'll place the tool exactly at that site. And what we end up doing is working through that robotic arm to drill right through the scalp, the skin, the muscle, the bone, through the inner table, right to the edge of the brain. And you could feel that as you puncture through. And then after that, we place through the robot an anchor, which is a small metallic piece with threads that actually screws into the skull. It gets put into the skull at the exact perfect angle where you want your electrode to go. Then we bring the robotic arm back to measure from the tip of the anchor in three-dimensional space to say, okay, we want the electrode is going to screw in here. How long do we let the electrode stick out? Then we take an electrode, measure that length, and just screw it in. It's that simple. And it happens very, very quickly. We could put an electrode in every four minutes. And that is a procedure without robotics that was impossible to do. Yes, there's technology actually invented at our university years ago by one of my colleagues that allows us to tell where the brain is in three-dimensional space, where the MRI is, and you could, using a handheld device, place anything anywhere, but not to that level of accuracy. So without robotics, it just couldn't be done. It takes an operation that would be impossible and dangerous to can be done in two hours. The advantage too is that they don't leak spinal fluid out of these because the holes are so small and everything is so snug. So it's a lot better tolerated. You can imagine after a giant operation with spinal fluid leaking all over the place and a big incision and electrodes sticking out that you wouldn't feel very good to stay like that for weeks until you had enough seizures for us to gather the information you need. We've had one poor patient who was having two or three seizures a week on medication, undergo a stage two monitoring and the minute we put them in, she stopped seizing. But she was comfortable enough to actually stay with those electrodes for weeks. And eventually we had to remove them. That's something that would have been too dangerous to do for risks of infection with the old kind of technology.